Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got myself in this situation. Well, it all started when I wanted to Nuzlocke Pokemon Hard Gold without evolving and without using single stage Pokemon. A hardcore Nuzlocke is the most popular way to challenge yourself in a Pokemon game, but I decided to take it a step further. But briefly, it means only one Pokemon per route, all feints are permanent, no items in battle, you must play on set mode, and you can't level past a gym leader's ace Pokemon. If this interests you, feel free to try out your own Nuzlocke too. We begin with picking our starter Pokemon. I decide to go with Totodile, that way our rival will have Meganium late game, who is well known for being one of the worst starter Pokemon of all time. Seriously, it literally does nothing. Overall, I plan a lot of my early game decisions around the late game, because that's when the game is going to be the most challenging, and hopefully I won't have to do something like fight Claire's Kingdra with a Rattata or something. Hopefully anyway, you can never really predict the future. I easily beat my rival TSB, and oh yeah, all my nicknames are named after members of the channel, that's my nickname theme for the run. I tell my mom to save some money, because aside from being financially responsible, it's also because my mom can buy the item Choice Scarf, which is otherwise unobtainable. Late in the game, my unevolved Pokemon are going to be way too slow to compete with evolved Pokemon, so having a Choice Scarf available increases my options considerably. On Route 29, I get my first encounter, Sentret, who is garbage. Then, for my second encounter, I already have to do some planning. I make sure to do my encounter in Route 30, in the night. That's because Rattata has a 40% chance of appearing in the night, which is the most it can be. The reason I want to do this is because on Route 46, if I want to get a Geodude whose rock typing helps versus the flying bug and normal type gyms, I have to catch Rattata first. If I catch Rattata before Route 46, because of the duplicate clause, I can guarantee Geodude in Route 46. Similarly, Rattata helps guarantee Ghastly, which is good versus a fighting type gym. This isn't as big a deal though, because I could use a Repel manipulation strategy anyway. Because Ghastly can be level 6 and Repel works on only low level Pokemon, if I use Repel with a level 6 Pokemon in the lead, I can guarantee Ghastly anyway. It's likely I will use this strategy at some point in the run, so it's good to make a note of it now. Of course, even with all the planning, Rattata is only a 40% encounter, and I get Hoot Hoot instead. Fortunately, I can try again in Route 31, but I get Bellsprout here too. I'm running out of options and I really need a Rattata. Finally, I try again in Route 32 and I catch the coveted Rattata. I can now guarantee catching a Geodude. I catch my Geodude in Route 46 and then I get my Ghastly in Sprout Tower. I get a Zubat in Dark Cave and I choose an Egg in Violet City. I pick Slugma because I think a Ligma joke could be funny at some point, but also because it's a fire type which is relatively uncommon. But now that I'm in Violet City, I head to the first gym where I fight Faulkner. Faulkner is a flying type gym leader who doesn't even have a Johto flying type. I don't understand that at all, they could have at least given him Hootoot. But whatever it is, Geodude can pretty cleanly defeat Faulkner with its high defense and rock throw. Again, I don't anticipate the early game being too difficult, but maybe Pidgeotto could have been more dangerous if I didn't have a Geodude. I get the Roost TM which I save for later because I think it'll be valuable. In a hardcore Nuzlocke, you can't use items like potions in battle, so having a healing move is amazing for a lot of Pokemon. I get the old rod and I go and fish up a Magikarp. Magikarp is terrible because I can't evolve it into Gyarados but I get it for the culture. There's no way I'm going to ignore the best Nuzlocke Pokemon of all time in my first challenge Nuzlocke video. In Union Cave, I can either get Sandshrew or Onix, but I decide that I really want an Onix and I'm not willing to risk getting a Sandshrew. Onix is high defense that could be valuable later, at least more valuable than whatever Sandshrew can do. Instead, I repel through Union Cave, and I'm going to come back later after I get Surf. Once I get Surf, I can access regions of Union Cave that can guarantee me an Onyx because of Duplicate Claws. When I enter Route 33, I intentionally don't pick up anything here either. I'm waiting till I get Headbutt, that way I can try and encounter an Apom in the Headbutt trees. A lot of Pokemon that were created without an evolution initially like Onyx have decent enough stats to be usable, and Apom is no exception. I catch a Slowpoke in Slowpoke Cave and head to Bugsy, the bug type gym leader. Once again, Geodude Rock Throw and High Defense easily beats the gym and I secure my second gym badge. I get the U-Turn TM and I'm not sure if it's going to be useful, but pivots are always valuable to bring in Pokemon safely. I once again destroy my rival and then I head to Azalea Town and then Ilex Forest so I can teach Rattata Headbutt. In Ilex Forest, I try to get a Pineco who could be useful with self-destruct, but unfortunately I get a Caterpie instead. On Route 34, I encounter an Abra, which is both good and bad. Abra can be really decent with its high special attack, 
but it's unfortunately hard to catch because it can flee immediately with teleport. Statistically, my best option is to go for a hypnosis and then start throwing pokeballs. Unfortunately, Abra dodges a hypnosis and I'm unable to catch it. I head back to Azalea Town and headbutt where I can either get Sparrow or Apom. Fortunately, I do get Apom. I delayed the Route 33 encounter just in case I got Sparrow here, but because I didn't, I can go back to Route 33 and catch something else in the wild grass. I get Hoppip, which is probably not going to be good, but I'll take it. I encounter Pineco on Route 35, which I'm quite happy about as it enables self-destruct strategies if I ever need it. And then I encounter a guaranteed execute in the National Park. Remember that repel trick I mentioned before? I can use that in Route 36 to try and get a Growlithe. Growlithe is valuable because it either has Intimidate, which is one of the best abilities in the game, or Flash Fire, which is very good in its own right. The only complication is that Growlithe has Roar, which it can use to roar me out and prevent me from catching it. I can catch Growlithe in the next route too, so it's not the end of the world, but I would obviously rather not waste an encounter. I do have the Taunt TM which I picked up earlier, but I'm not sure if I want to use it here on one of my Pokemon and use it to stop Growlithe's roar. It's a trade-off I have to make, because I do anticipate Taunt being useful in the Elite Four. I make a judgement call and decide not to teach any of my Pokemon Taunt and risk it. Fortunately, I catch Growlithe on the first try. We've assembled a decent crew of Pokemon, but now we enter the first real challenge, Whitney and her Miltank. Geodude is going to be the star of the show, but Miltank is known for being deadly and I'm not going to risk my run on Stomp flinches. I need a better strategy. My plan is to have Pineco to be the one to defeat Clefairy. That way when Miltank comes in afterwards, I can self-destruct on it for big damage. The problem is that Pineco alone cannot reliably win versus Clefairy. Aside from Metronome, I could realistically take too much damage and then I would just faint on the first turn versus Miltank. Not only do I have to position Pineco to beat Clefairy, I have to position it with enough health left. I lead with Ghastly to throw off a Hypnosis. I hit on the first try, but I would have been able to keep trying as Clefairy can't really touch Ghastly. Then I switch to Growlithe for Intimidate and also to get damage. After I get enough damage, I switch to Execute to get a Leech Seed and then I switch to my Pineco. With Leech Seed and Intimidate support, Pineco should be able to defeat Clefairy and stay at max health. The only unpredictability is Metronome, but I just have to accept that. After Clefairy goes down, Miltank comes in. We do get hit by a tract and are fortunately able to boom immediately. This is why it was so important for Pineco to be at max health. I would have to have as many chances as possible to help protect against bad luck. If I got immobilized by a track, I would have had many more chances to boom later. What the boom does is, it allows us to go to execute and leech seed risk free because Whitney will always go for the heal. After I get the leech seed, I go to Geodude and Miltank cannot beat Geodude if Geodude can recover HP every turn. Geodude finishes off Whitney and we get our third gym badge. Was this overkill? Maybe, but I'm still happy with the result. After beating Whitney, a lot of Johto opens up. There's a lot of encounters here and not all of them are relevant. I catch Pidgey in Route 37, Machop in Mount Mortar, Mareep in Route 43, Mankey in Route 42, Snubble in Route 38, and Magnemite in Route 39. Then I get the Good Rod and Backtrack and catch Krabby in Olivine City, Staryu in Route 40, Poliwag in Ecruteak City, and Coughing in Burnt Tower. We now have an extremely diverse roster of Pokemon we can use going forward. We fight our rival once again, but it's not too much of a challenge as Bayleaf does nothing as usual and loses to Growlithe. The rest of the fight is easy too. Next up is Morty, the fourth gym leader and a ghost type trainer. Rattata easily beats Ghastly with Crunch, but then comes in Haunter with Gengar coming up after that. Fortunately though, the Hoot Hoot we caught earlier has a perfect matchup. With its ability Insomnia, Haunter and Gengar's Hypnosis don't work. Because of the way the AI works, the AI doesn't know you have Insomnia, so it will try and put you to sleep first before going for anything else. If you switch out and come back in, it will even forget you had Insomnia and go for it again. I have to play around Curse Damage, but it's not too big of a deal. I do have to be careful about mean look strategies from Gengar, but I come prepared with Baton Pass Apom. Apom can Baton Pass out of the mean look into Hoot Hoot. Similar to Haunter, Gengar can't really touch Hoot Hoot except with Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch has low PP and I'm very happy to just stall it out and go for a guaranteed win. Slow and Steady wins the race and we can get our fourth gym badge. With Surf, I can now get the most useful item of the game, the Choice Specs in Lake Rage. I am really going to struggle with power late in the game and Choice Specs will help fix that issue. I also backtrack to Union Cave and Surf to reach the Onyx location. 
Then I catch Wooper in the ruins of Alf and then fish in Route 41 to catch Tentacool. Now I fight Chuck, the fighting type gym leader. My plan is a little more long term than usual and I set up Toxic Spikes on turn 1 for Poliwrath, his second Pokemon. My plan is to switch between Ghastly and Water Absorb Wooper versus Focus Punch and Surf on Poliwrath. Versus Primate, my plan is to get an Intimidate off with Growlithe and then get a Leech Seed with Execute. From there, I can easily switch stall all of Primeape's HP. However, I have a tough time getting a Leech Seed to land because of Primeape's double teams. Along with Rock Slide Flinch, I can't hit a single Leech Seed. And now I'm screwed. I have to go to my backup plans now, but because I let Primeape set up so many double teams, it's going to be a nightmare just to get an attack off. I do have Intimidate Growlithe to make Primeape's attacks as weak as possible to give me more chances to hit my attacks, but critical hits ignore attack drops and I'm always one crit away from something fainting. Finally, the Primeape switches out, probably because it ran out of Rock Slide PP, so we avoid disaster. Polyrad gets switch stalled as expected until it faints and then Primeape comes back in. I'm not worried because it's poison now and it's out of Rock Slide PP. Except it's not out of Rock Slide PP. I wasn't counting and I just thought that that's why it switched out, because it ran out of PP. I was careless and it cost me my ghastly because I didn't expect Rock Slide. All of a sudden I'm still in trouble. Primate will eventually faint because of poison, but I still have to last that long. I lose Wooper to a focus punch and I'm still just barely hanging on while Chuck still has his hyper potion. Fortunately my tentacle bails me out of my own mistakes with some critical hits and I escape with only losing two Pokemon. They were important Pokemon because Ghastly had a lot of immunities and Wooper had the valuable water absorb, but considering how close I came to whiting out, I'll take only losing two Pokemon. I have access to a few more areas now and I catch Miss Drevis in Cliff Cave. Miss Drevis is a great encounter that's guaranteed by the duplicate clause because everything else that's possible to catch has already been caught. I also catch a seal in Route 47. In the Safari Zone, I try to catch a Murkrow but it runs away. Murkrow would have been a great Pokemon to have but going in, I knew that the Safari Zone would be unreliable and I was okay with missing out. Now I go to Mahogany Town to deal with Team Rocket. The choice specs I got earlier comes in handy and makes these fights relatively easy. The level curves are weird because of Johto's non-linearity and I make sure to take advantage. With that out of the way, we move on to Price, who is also challenging to deal with. Seal and Dugong aren't issues because I can bring a Choice Specs Magnemite to deal with them, however Pyloswine is deceptively threatening and the issues of having unevolved Pokemon become clear. Although Staryu is faster than Pyloswine, it dies to one Mud Bomb and doesn't one-hit KO itself. I'm already using my Choice Specs on Magnemite so I need a different way to get damage, but that's still tough because of how strong Pyloswine is. I come up with a plan to pivot through it. I go Slowpoke to get a Yawn off and then I go to Miss Drevis with Levitate. I get a little damage off with Shadow Ball and that's all I need. Now I can go Staryu because Pyloswine will never use Mud Bomb versus Miss Drevis. I finish off the Pyloswine with a strong water attack and that has just enough power to KO. To finish off, I use Staryu with Recover to get enough damage on Dewgong to force it to rest. Then Magnemite comes back in and finishes the job and we get the 6th Gym Badge. Now we have to fight Jasmine, the 7th gym leader, so my plan is to use Torrent Totodile. But how do I get Totodile in Torrent range? Getting attacked by random Pokemon can be risky if I have to risk crits to do it. Instead, I get intentionally poisoned by a coughing, that way I can use poison to drain my health down into Torrent range. Once I have Torrent, Choice Specs, Totodile, I'm unstoppable and I can one-hit KO all of Jasmine's Pokemon for an easy 7th gym badge. Steelix has an incredible physical defense but low special defense and that makes it very vulnerable. Team Rocket decides to invade and some of the admins can be tricky. For example, there's an admin who has multiple self-destruct coughings. Fortunately, Mischievous can handle the situation relatively easily. Then we have the first rival battle that's actually problematic. Golbat can flinch and has Confuse Ray but fortunately Geodude is able to tough it out. I have a diverse enough team and I'm able to deal with the rest. Sneasel loses to Machop, Bellsprout takes care of Meganium, Snubble beats Haunter, and Growlite takes care of Magnemite. Also, our mom has finally saved up enough money to buy us a Choice Scarf and a Focus Sash which are two valuable items. We fight the last of Team Rocket and their boss Archer, and Archer's Houndoom is actually scary, 
but because it only has physical attacks for whatever reason, Intimidate and Rock types can deal with it and we defeat Team Rocket forever. We get a few more encounters like Lickitung in Route 44 and Swinub in Ice Pat, which I accidentally KO. Swinub would be useful versus Lance, so I'm a little disappointed. Just like how we caught Growlithe using a Repel strategy, we can use the same strategy with a level 24 Pokemon to catch Gligar in Route 45. Now we're against Claire, the 8th gym leader, and I get the Ice Beam TM to get ready. Versus Claire, I start off with a Choice Scarf Toxic Spikes Tentacool. It's usually not a good idea to lock yourself into a non-attacking move, but my strategy here is really reliant on Toxic Spikes. I absolutely cannot afford to risk getting flinched by Bite or crit by Bite. I switch to Magnemite because Gyarados' strongest move is Dragon Rage, which always does 40 damage. Remember, in Generation 4, Steel resists Dark, so Bite wouldn't have done too much damage. I knock out Gyarados with a Discharge and Dragonair comes in next. My Staryu does have Ice Beam, but it doesn't one-hit KO the Dragonairs on the team. That's why I have Toxic Spikes. I bring along bulky Sacrifice Pokemon like Hoot Hoot and Lickitung, who can get off damage just in case Dragonair activates Shed Skin early. The Hoot Hoot Sacrifice gets enough damage for Staryu to one-hit KO. For the second Dragonair, I go to Lickitung to try and stall out some more turns, but because of the paralysis, it gets too risky. If I get paralyzed two turns in a row and Shed Skin activates, I don't get enough damage on Dragonair for Ice Beam Staryu to KO. I go Tentacool on Dragonair and sacrifice it for a Poison Jab. Staryu KOs the Dragonair now that it's taken enough damage. Kingdra is a total monster and because of its water type, my Ice Beam won't do anything. Fortunately, I came prepared. I sacrificed Lickitung to set up the greatest strategy of the run yet. Fear Rattata. Focus Ash, Endeavor, Quick Attack Rattata lets Rattata bring Kingdra to 1 HP. Kingdra is guaranteed to heal on the second turn and I don't even need Quick Attack. Poison does the job for me and knocks out Kingdra. We get the 8th Gym Badge and we're ready to take on the Elite Four. Well, almost. There's one huge roadblock in the way. The Kimono Girls. The Kimono Girls are a gauntlet of high-level evolutions. You have to prepare for every single one and you can't heal between the fights. I have to come up with my most careful strategy yet, because if I lose here, it's all over. The first Kimono Girl has a Confused Ray Umbreon, and I use a Persimberry Guts Machop in order to beat it. Even with Guts, Umbreon is tanky and lives one hit. Machop finishes the Umbreon off and the first Kimono Girl is easy enough. But the next Kimono Girl has an Espeon, which is strong and fast. Very few things can take it on 1v1, let alone switch into it. I sacrifice Machop to get a free switch into Choice Specs Misdreavus. Misdreavus can live one hit and then one hit KO back. Because Espeon has a high special defense, I have to use a Choice Specs on Misdreavus in order to secure the one hit KO. The next Kimono Girl brings Flareon and my old lead Machop fainted, so I have to go to whatever my second Pokemon was. The truth is, I planned Machop's death from the beginning. There was no way to switch into Espeon with the tools I had and I planned Machop's death. It must be an awful feeling knowing that you're scripted for death, but it was a decision I had to make for the greater good. Choice Scarf Waterfall Totodile takes care of Flareon. Totodile was the best fit for the job because it's a physical attacker. Flareon has a high special defense, so Pokemon like Staryu would be more difficult to use, and I already used my choice specs on Misdreavus. Up next is Jolteon, which is not a threat at all. Geodude easily deals with Jolteon, and one Earthquake is enough to KO. Vaporeon is next and is a little bit more tricky. I use Poliwag with Water Absorb to switch into Vaporeon. All Vaporeon can do is Quick Attack, but I have Belly Drum on Poliwag. With the attack boost from Belly Drum, one Body Slam is enough to knock out the Vaporeon. And with that, we finish the Kimono Gauntlet with only one death. Also, I meet Ho-Oh, but it doesn't look too powerful, and it doesn't look like it's worth my time, so I run away from it. I catch Horsey in Whirl Islands, and looking through Victory Road, I don't see anything too valuable, so I decide to just repel through and ignore my encounter. If I ever need something, I can always come back later. I also get arrogant and end up in a situation where I have to sacrifice my Totodile to a trainer in Victory Road. Unfortunate, but we're close to the Elite Four and we can only take six Pokemon in there anyway. Similarly, I sacrifice Pokemon I don't need in the last rival fight just to make my life easy and to give me free switches. And with that, we beat the rival for the last time and we make it to the Elite Four. But first, we have to do a little EV training. For the unfamiliar, Pokemon have something called effort values which affect your stats. 
Without going into too much detail, the more effort values you have in a stat, the more that stat grows. For example, beating a Machop gives you 1 attack effort value. I have to EV train Mysterious' speed stat because it actually has a plus special defense minus speed nature. Similarly, I EV train Staryu for special attack and speed. Staryu is going to throw off some Ice Beams versus Lance, and I have to make sure they're as strong as they can be. First we have Will, the Psychic type trainer who is straightforward. Miss Dreavus with Choice Spec Shadow Ball is unstoppable for the Psychic types and leads to an easy win. I make sure to equip an EXP share to Staryu during the first few Elite Four battles because I want Staryu at a high enough level to beat the champion's Dragonites. By standard Nuzlocke rule sets, the level cap is only for the start of the Elite Four and anything after that is fair game. Versus Koga, Gligar easily wins. Gligar has Swords Dance, Earthquake, Roost, and Feint Attack. Gligar uses Ariados as setup fodder and can Swords Dance all the way to the maximum, because Ariados cannot touch Gligar. Even if Giga Drain crits multiple times, Gligar can roost off the damage. Earthquake hits most of Koga's Pokemon and Feint Attack hits Crobat. There are some complications with potential double team Crobat, I make sure to have Feint Attack which never misses. I also have Roost to roost out of crit range. Crobat itself takes a while to beat because Feint Attack has low base power, but it's not risky in any way. Venomot Psychic could be annoying if it crits, but I do have Onyx in the back for Crobat just in case things go wrong. I also have a Person Berry for Venomot Supersonic. Fortunately, I don't get too unlucky and I don't have to think about the worst case scenario. Gligar cleans up for another easy Elite 4 win. Versus Bruno, Gligar easily wins in the same way as it can do versus Koga. I set up multiple Swords Dances on Hitmon top and then go for an easy Earthquake win. The only possible way to lose is from a burn from Hitmonlee's Blaze Kick or from Swagger. That's why I equip Gligar with a Lumberry to cover both of those situations. There's an argument that Bruno is the worst Elite 4 member ever, and honestly, I agree. Gligar finishes off Bruno, and so far the Elite 4 has been the easiest part of the run. Now we have Karen, who is actually challenging, because her Pokemon are good, and there's some meaningful type diversity. I have to make some preparations and I use the TMs I stored up on Gligar. I teach Gligar U-Turn and Taunt to match up well versus Karen's Umbreon. I also give Staryu a Cherry Berry. It doesn't need the EXP share anymore and a Cherry Berry is more valuable to protect from Karen's Gengar using Lick. The sequencing of the lead matchup is quite important. I use Taunt to stop Confuse Ray but more importantly I want to be able to create a situation where I knock out Umbreon with Apom. But as it turns out, the best way to do that is to not knock out Umbreon with Apom. Instead, it's to use U-Turn to simulate that situation. I use U-Turn once to get a little damage, and then use Sword Dance to do a maxed out attack U-Turn to finish the job. One maxed out U-Turn alone doesn't KO, which is why I have to do a little damage first. Because I get Apom in with U-Turn, that baits out Gengar with Focus Blast. I can switch between Apom and Misdreavus to run Gengar out of Focus Blast PP. Fortunately, Focus Blast has low PP, so this isn't too painful to do. Once I run Gengar out of PP, I can use Nasty Plot Agility Baton Pass Apom to turn Staryu into a powerful threat that can one-hit KO anything. This is also why I need the Cherry Berry on Staryu. There's a chance that Gengar will use Destiny Bond on Apom as I Baton Pass to Staryu. If that happens, then I have to waste one turn to get rid of the Destiny Bond, and I would be vulnerable to Lick. But once I have the power and speed boost, I can defeat the Vileplume and Houndoom and defeat Karen. Only the champion is left. Going into Lance, I change Cherry Berry to Choice Specs on Staryu. Versus Gyarados, I can pick up a KO with a Choice Specs Thunderbolt. Dragonite comes in next, and while I do have Ice Beam, I have to switch out because I'm locked into Thunderbolt. Unfortunately, I have to sacrifice Apom in order to bring Staryu back in. Staryu KOs one Dragonite with Ice Beam, and the AI isn't very good, so it sends out another Dragonite who also gets KO'd by Ice Beam. Aerodactyl comes in next, and it does outspeed me, and Ice Beam doesn't KO, so I have to switch out. I go to Gligar, who can tank hits, but can't do much damage back. I use it to U-turn into Onix. Onix is one of the few unevolved Pokemon who can take on the power of Aerodactyl, and I brought her with me for basically only Aerodactyl. A few Rock Tombs from Onyx take care of Aerodactyl, and the last Dragonite comes in next. I don't need Onyx anymore, and I sacrifice her too. The last Dragonite actually has a plus special defense nature, so Staryu's Ice Beam doesn't KO. 
Instead, I sacrifice Horsey in order to get enough damage on the Dragonite. With the extra damage from Horsey, Dragonite is in range and feigns to star you. Next up is Charizard who is deceptively threatening. I have to switch out because I'm locked into an Ice type move. I sacrifice Gligar because I don't need it anymore and then I go to Misdreavus. Misdreavus is tanky and I use that bulk to live a hit and throw off enough weak Shadow Balls to put Charizard in range of Staryu. Staryu comes back in with the entire team fainted and delivers the final blow with a choice spec surf. And 16 deaths later, we are now champions of the Johto region. Thank you to everyone who supported me during the run and the best way to show your support is to subscribe to the channel. If I see a lot of new subscribers then I know that I should keep making more of these type of Nuzlocke videos. I had a lot of fun and the satisfaction of seeing plans work is what makes it worth it. Let me know what you want to see next down in the comments below and have a good day.